Hi and welcome to all the students who could join us this afternoon. I'm sure it's been a long day and hopefully I can make the last talk a bit entertaining for you and uh, more importantly um, informative. So my talk is titled Science is Another Language um, and for me so was English. So you can kind of see um, what my talk is going to be about. Um, so the outline of my talk um, would be, I will talk to you about my personal journey. Um, I will talk to you about the neuroscience research that I do and how I came about to go to neuroscience. And the average day in neuroscience and career options um, and pathways to health and um, career in, a career in health and helping others in general. So if you have any questions, just um, type them up and um, interrupt me and feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have any questions regarding any slides. Okay, so um, I have a few objectives um, in this talk. Um, one of them, as I said, is to give you a snapshot of neuroscience as a career um, through my story and my journey into neuroscience um, and hopefully um, promote it for you to, um, as a career and um, as a rewarding career, um, and if not a science, a health um, professional career in general. And um, more importantly, I'm hoping not to bore you in my talk. Okay, so my personal journey. This here is uh, us, um, this picture here was taken on my iPhone about seven years ago at the Campbelltown campus of the University of Western Sydney. Um, and we're all, me and my friend were walking past and we saw this set of stairs and it kind of symbolised the journey through life um, and how we all start at the bottom here and through education and development make, make our ways to our goals which are up there. Um, and so I guess this is um, where we all are, um, you being somewhere on this first step there, making your way um, to the top wherever your goals will take you. All right, so my personal journey. Um, as I alluded to earlier, science is another language and English was for me as well, um, and still is. It's not my first language. So I was originally um, born in another country, um, a small country on the Mediterranean Sea. That's the Mediterranean there. Um, and this is the capital, Beirut. So the country is, um, where I'm from is Lebanon. Um, and before we... Um, before my family and I moved to Australia, um, I, I was born and brought up in Lebanon and um, was raised there and I went to school there. And um, it wasn't, and that's the, that's the school that I um, went to, so I kind of did um, a lot of my high schooling there up until about, um, I was about 15, so um, quite a long time. And then the family decided to move to Australia and just um, hop over. And the way we hopped over was on a, um, a flying kangaroo. Um, not that one, though. It was this one. So, um, and then we arrived in Sydney um, in 2003. So not, relatively not that long ago. And like many of, um, of you or your um, families um, that have moved to Australia at some point, um, English isn't, isn't a first language and it is a hurdle to overcome. And many of... Um, you now would be um, when you go to university and you take up a, um, a degree it'll be a whole new language as well um, but nevertheless through persistence you'll overcome it so what did I do when I um, came here um, at the age of 15 so I went straight to school and I went to Bass High School um, so it's a school in Sydney and um, where I learnt um, halfway through year 10 um, what school certificate is and what high school certificate is, which is a completely new program and completely new um, system of high schooling. And just to give you an, uh, an idea of how foreign English was to me, um, when I went to um, Bass High School, in the very first week on the lunch break, I, um, I was allocated a group of, um, I guess, um, friends and mentors to kind of um, um, help me integrate. And um, for the very first day we were sitting there, the whole of lunchtime, um, 
the guys were discussing a story and they were talking about things and till now I still don't know what they were talking about because the whole lunchtime passed and I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, but eventually you, you know, pick things up and start understanding and express yourself a bit better. Um, so what subjects did I do in year 11 and 12? Um, in year 11 and 12, because I really had um, a lot of passion for science, I, um, I did chemistry, I did biology and I did maths. Um, and being a, a recent arrived migrant, I had to do um, English as second language, which is really good. It, it helps you um, really learn English from its um, basis. Um, but also picked Arabic, so I thought it would be a good, uh, a good way to um, help me with my uh, ATA, or yeah, I at the time it was called. Um, but more importantly, to help me really learn about the Australian, I guess, the Australian society and culture and really um, help me with, um, with learning English, I, I did a, what I call a four unit of um, what is this? Because at the time, that's how I asked the question, what is this, what is this? And um, I always asked that question and it got to a point where everybody got so frustrated, um, they looked like Gerard Butler there <laughs> by the time um, I was asking that question a couple months later. But nevertheless, my persistence um, helped me learn and um, helped me really better understand um, the system and English in general. Okay. Um, so from there, what did I do? I, um, I went to straight into university. So um, straight after high school, I went to the University of Western Sydney. So I enrolled in a Bachelor of Medical Science. Now, it's a very broad um, degree of science um, in the sense that it teaches you um, a lot of areas, different areas of science. Um, so it gives you a good solid foundation to science in general, so biological and non-biological, so chemistry and other things. Um, and it gives you the opportunity uh, not only just to build a strong foundation, but also um, to it gives you a taste of different areas of science and then allows you to choose which area you'd like to go into um, if you'd like to continue in science. Um, the, some of the challenges that I've found um, coming out of high school um, and being from a non-English speaking background going into university, as you would expect, um, some of the challenges are um, the, the, the writing skills, the English writing skills, my proficiency wasn't so high at the time, particularly in scientific jargon. Um, I learned science in French, which is not so different to English, but still the, uh, the, the, the structuring sentences and writing scientific reports is still very difficult. Um, it's quite different, um, which again, through persistency and, and repetition and you know, assignments after assignments, you end up um, you know, getting used to things and you end up, um, I guess, a bit better at it. Um, now, in my degree, um, doing the Bachelor of Medical Science. What are the what are the topics that I um, studied? So I studied um, broadly. I studied anatomy. I studied um, so anatomy is the science of what is um, in the body. So the bones and the muscles and all those things. And um, specifically, physiology is how these things work and what they do. Uh, microbiology. So the science of um, bacteria, viruses, and um, parasites around in and around us um, genetics um, also so the genetic material um, our genetic makeup and molecular science so the very molecular interactions within cells um, or between cells um, in our body so again it's a it's a very broad area of science and it really helped um, help me not only learn the foundation of sciences in general the medical sciences but also give me a, a a quite a sound understanding of what area of science I'd like and what areas of science I don't like. Um, and so after finishing my three years of medical science, I then um, continued doing research. So I did a one year of, um, so honours is one year, I did a one year of um, honours research where I was uh, running a, um, a project. But um, my undergraduate was in more molecular based science. And doing it, it was great, as I said, because it gives you that foundation um, in science. But I quickly realised that I 
don't wouldn't like a career in molecular biology or molecular science um, and I made a transition to human-based research and the area that I went into in neuroscience is neurophysiology which I'll explain in details later um, what it is so I did one year of honors um, in, in neurophysiology and I liked it so much that I um, continued into a PhD so um, it's, that's, a, that's another three years of doctoral research in neurophysiology. Now, the thing to keep in mind when talking about um, postgraduate work, so honours or PhD, you become a specialist in that area. This becomes your area of specialty, not only nationally, but also worldwide. And um, so you've got to choose which area to go into um, very wisely. Um, and uh, because it's got to have, you've got to have the passion for it. The great thing about um, science research is it's a lot of fun. It's great fun. It's a lot of hard work, long hours, um, but you have to have the passion um, to discover the unknown, to drive these long hours and hard work, which is what makes it great fun and really, really satisfying. Okay, so. Um, as I said, I went into neurophysiology, which is, which is a, um, a really a, a part of um, neuroscience. Um, I'll explain quickly what neuroscience research is in general. So when we say neuroscience, everybody thinks brain. Everyone thinks of these pictures. Everyone thinks of um, really just a brain research. But it's not. It actually extends beyond that. So... Um, Science, neuroscience is the science of the nervous system, which extends um, to, from central to peripheral. So central nervous system is, um, as you would expect, centrally, so the brain and the spinal cord. They're, and so anyone that does research in the central nervous system will be doing research either in the brain or in the spinal cord. Um, whereas peripheral nervous system type uh, neuroscience research is anything that um, all of the neurons that stem out of the, um, either the brain to go and control other areas or the, uh, stem out of the spinal cord to go and control organs in our chest or in our arms. You know, I'm moving my hands. How am I doing that? And these are done via nerves that stem out of the um, spinal cord. Now, the study of these nerves and nerve traffic and impulses that come out of the spinal cord or from the brain is known as the peripheral nervous system. And it's a very, very important area um, of research as well. Okay, so what else is neuroscience research? Well, what neuroscience research is by employing technology, you look for the unknown. And the, the unknown is we, we don't know, we, as much as we know a lot about um, the brain and the spinal cord and neuroscience in general, we, there are still a lot of challenges that we can't overcome. So you might be familiar with epilepsy, for example. Or you might be familiar with dementia. So those are still areas that are very, very, um, I guess, still uh, primitive in, in how much we know. Although we know a lot, there are still a lot to go. Uh, there's still a lot to go. So we, we really are still looking for the unknown. But more importantly as well, we, we, we challenge the known. So when someone does discover something... We need to, as, as uh, in the research community, we challenge it. Um, and challenging gives us uh, um, stronger evidence. And stronger evidence gives us um, a better practice of the finding when we put it into clinical context. Okay, so this is very broad, but that generally is what neuroscience research is. So it's looking for the unknown and challenging the known. And the last bit, and that's my favourite part, is to teach. There is absolutely no point in discovering something and not teach it to someone else. You teach it to your colleagues, to your peer, and that's not only just at your university when you go to university, so not just at the university um, nationally, but also internationally. So the science and neuroscience um, community is a very international community, and all of your findings are um, taught to your peers and you will learn from them as well. And also teaching is um, by working, at, for example, at a university, you will be teaching um, university students. So a very rewarding career. Okay, 
So what is it exactly in neuroscience that I do? Um, I'm in autonomic neuroscience. So just to keep it very simple, it's part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so things that will stem out of the spinal cord. And things autonomic, so it's like an automatic, right? So you don't consciously um, think about that part of your, um, I guess, nervous system. Not like if I give a command to my bicep to flex, um, that's voluntary. So I look at the involuntary side of the nervous system. And how do I do that? I do that by employing this technique here. It's called microneurography. So what this is, um, this is me there doing a, um, a the, employing microneurography. So if, you, we, if we dissect the word microneurography, it's using a micro electrode, a very small needle, smaller than an acupuncture needle, to graph the neuronal impulses. So in other words, to record the electrical activity of our neurons. So And our neurons are... Um, like the electrical wires of our of our body that will connect our brain um, to our the rest of our systems. Okay, so I employ it to record the nerve impulses that come from the brain as a command to the blood vessels um, and, and our lower limb. So I'll give you another. I'll give you another. So this is a a close up of it. So. Um, there's a nerve just below your leg that carry these um, nerve impulses, and the nerve is called the you know, common peroneal nerve. Um, and this is another close-up and shows you the two electrodes. So the one electrode that goes just under the skin as a reference electrode that gives you a, a background um, noise, and the other electrode is the recording electrode, and as you can see, it goes towards the nerve. Um, and then the nerves, once the nerve signal is... Um, identified and this is the, this is an amplifier um, the the, the um, nerve traffic is then amplified and then through this wire is connected to a computer then the nerve traffic is recorded okay so this this technique of microneurography was developed in the 1960s so it's not a very recent um, development um, it was developed, a funny story, by two Swedish guys that, wa that believe that they can rec record these nerve impulses but couldn't get the ethics um, to, for it. So they started doing it on themselves and, and over about two years. And once they did that over two years, they monitored whether their nerve is getting damaged. Now, that could have been really bad if it was a, um, a bad technique, but lucky for them it wasn't. They kind of believed in it. But they developed this, and it gave us a great tool to examine what we call afferent um, nerve signal. So that's the signal going from our periphery to the brain, but also to record efferent signal, which is the command from the brain to our uh, periphery. Okay, and this is a, imagine, so um, if we cross-section a nerve, so this is the common peroneal nerve, um, if we do a cross-section of it, so if this is the nerve and we just do a cross-section, and I'll show you the front there, um, this is what we see. We see these fascicles, so these um, packets of spaghetti. And each, um, and inside of the, each fascicle, each spaghetti represents, let's say, an axon. So one wire that, that will go to one part of, um, to innovate one part of the leg. And these carry the, what we call the um, part of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic signal. Not to, keep it, uh, not to confuse you, but essentially what happens is, as this, this, these impulses increase, you get a constriction, so a narrowing of your blood vessels, which help you maintain blood pressure. Okay, so what happens when we, um, once these signals are sampled, so the signal goes to, to the computer and... We can record. Um, we can record it. So, um, before I just show you what it looks like on the computer, um, I'll tell you what else we can um, record. So, ECG is that bottom line there, right? And that's your heart rate. Okay. Um, this is this is also the heart rate, but this is the interpretation of it in a stepwise. So whether it goes up or down, up or down. But this is what you see probably essentially in the movies or that's what you see the interpretation of um, an ECG. 
Okay, we, also, we can also record things like blood pressure, we can, things, uh, we can record many other physiological things like um, respiration by putting a chest band um, across the chest, but um, just to keep it um, simple, this is the nerve signal. So you can see here we, we get a thick blue band um, and that's the background noise. And as you and it goes it goes in this direction. So as you approach these spikes, these spikes represent the impulses coming from the brain. So and you can hear them when we when we record them live. We're essentially tapping into the brain, communicating to the blood vessels in the leg, and we're essentially listening to um, life happening. So and what we hear is a big whoosh. So this will be going like. Shh, and as, it inc as we get an impulse, we hear poof, poof, poof. And these, I guess, sounds funny on, the, on your end probably, these noises, but the poof, so these spikes represent the command to um, constrict, so the, to, to narrow the um, vessels. All right. So, and then, so once we have these, uh, I guess, recordings, this technique, and understand the firing impulses, pro uh, the properties of the um, neurons, we can then do things, um, do multiple techniques um, to kind of better understand not only the cardiovascular system, but also how the, 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 the nervous system behaves um, in different cardiovascular challenges. Okay, so this here is one, of, one example, it's called the tilt test, where we have patients lying down, we put all these recordings as I showed you earlier, including the, um, um, including micro, the micro electrode to listen to the nerve, and then we tilt our uh, patient up and um, look at the firing properties and behaviours. Now here's an exciting thing. We can also couple it with brain imaging Okay, we can couple, so we are recording electrical activity, just to put it in perspective. We can record electrical activity in, um, uh, so through a tungsten microelectrode in a magnetic field, and if you've ever heard an MRI, or if you've ever seen an MRI, it's a very loud machine, very, very loud machine. And this was never done before. This is actually, fir was first, world first ever made and ever recorded possible in Australia, made possible, sorry, but this, by this man here. This is Professor Vaughan Maysfield from the University of Western Sydney. And I've trained under him to do microelectro, to, uh, to do, sorry, uh, microneurography. And he was able to overcome the challenge of the magnetic challenge and the noise um, challenge to concurrently, so at the same time, scan the brain activity. So get an idea of how, what is happening in the brain but also, at the same time, get an idea of what's happening in the lower limb. So that allows us to not only map areas of the brain activated, but also um, backtrack to what happens when you get a signal in the leg and where is it coming from in those areas in, in the brain. And those areas will be correlating, um, of course, to the um, to the commands that control uh, peripheral br um, blood pressure. So the main message here, it's, it's an Australian invention and it's very exciting, it's world first and I'm one of the first people to work um, on this project with um, Professor Maysfield. So what happens, um, so the, the analysis of this brain scan and all that, I'll just keep it very short, is we get these images of the brain and then what happens is we have areas that light up um, that tell us which part of our brain um, is activated that's driving this nerve impulses that we're recording in the leg. And this is very important, um, particularly in patients with heart failure, so where the heart can't efficiently pump anymore, um, and or, or sleep apnea, so those who struggle, um, so struggle to breathe when they're sleeping, um, or uh, patients with um, constructive, uh, pardon me, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so COPD, so where they have a lot of uh, problems in their lungs and their breathing, which also affect their cardiovascular system, so their heart um, system. So, uh, and we do a lot of that kind of research. Okay, so technology of the trade, tech of the trade. So what, what, what are the, I've just picked a few. I mean, there are multiple, multiple, multiple 
um, techniques that you can use um, and that people use in neuroscience. But I just wanted to pick a few just to give you an idea um, and to give you um, just, you know, uh, I guess a taste of what people use out there. So in neuroimaging, I've showed you what MRI does. In electrophysiology, so remember the electrical impulses and the physiology of how things work, that's, that's microneography, yeah? Um, and there are other things like patch clamping, so where you um, tap into the one neuron and it's, um, it's I guess, activity in um, particularly, you know, in, from a, a brain neuron, um, and that's really typically done in, um, in animals. Um, the other thing is, uh, for example, like a brainwave test, so the brainwave readings, um, it's called EEG, electroencephalography. So electrical encephalos brain and graphing the electrical signal of the brain, um, and that's, that's this one here, it will look like this. So it will have, a, it will have a, a cap with lots of um, electrodes on top and reading the brain, uh, the brain electrical waves. Um, and that's, that's particularly good um, to not only study in research, but in, in medicine we use it um, to study and diagnose conditions like epilepsy or like sleep disorders. And one more uh, technique that I've used, um, uh, put in here, is transcranial, I'm supposed to be trans, not tran, um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So um, it's, we refer to it as TMS, that's this one here. So what happens is you get a, a as it says, so a magnetic stimulus, so this um, two, pol two polar um, mag magnetic field there, and transcranial means across the cranium. And so you send a um, electrical, I guess, magnetic command to that part of the brain and see what happens in, the, in where, where it's supposed to control. So for example, if I um, stimulate this part of the brain on the motor cortex, I'll get, um, for example, where, the, where it controls the finger movement, and then I'll get um, a finger movement, okay? Um, so what TMS does, it can activate areas of the brain which help us um, identify um, effective, effectiveness of the area. And this is good for diagnostic of patients with um, stroke that have just had a stroke. So they've had um, part of their brain being compromised. So we, we use it to see what happens. Um, spinal cord injury, someone's been in a car accident, um, and then we use it to see uh, at what level um, the traffic is being um, I guess, interrupted and stopped. Okay. All right, so other areas of neuroscience. Um, so look, neuroscience is very, very, very broad, as I said, and I've just picked a few um, just to say, just to show you how broad it is. So we have neurochemistry. So things like neurochemistry, we're looking at the neuroscience, uh, the chemical neuroscience. So the chemistry, sorry, chemical changes around the neuron. Um, so that's, that's very, very important because it shows us how the chemicals can affect the neurons and um, and how it affects the brain and in turn the person. Neuroendocrinology, so quite a big word, but if you dissect it, neuro, so again neuroscience, endocrinology, just think about it as the hormones in our body. So essentially what it is, it's the relationship between the brain, so the neurons, and the glands that secrete those hormones. Um, Neuropsychology, so it's, it's the neuroscience of behavior. And the most interesting one that I find is neuroeconomics. It's a, it's a relatively a new field. And what it is, neuroeconomics, is the neuroscience of the economical decision that you make. So things about uh, financial decisions and, fina and, and your behavior around financial situations. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very broad um, area in neuroscience, and you can go into any subspecialty you'd like. Okay, um, so what's an average day in neuroscience? Well, this is the best part, experiments. Experiments is what every scientist really thrives about. Um, you wake up in the morning, you, you know you have an experiment, you're going to be excited because you're going to meet the patients, you're going to meet the participants, and you know you're going to do an experiment, you're going to get some data out of them. Um, and they get excited about being a part of it as well. And as I said, this is the best part. This is what we all look like when we know we've got experiments. Okay, so what else happens on an average day? So we run analysis. So if, we, if we're not doing experiments, we then have previous data that will then analyze um, 
on our computers or however. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of communication with uh, patients or uh, participants. So when you decide to do a study, you have to recruit um, participants, and there's a lot of communication. So a lot of our a lot of our time is also dedicated to um, the relationships with patients or with participants. And you do the experiments, you do the analysis, and as I said, part of teaching, part of neuroscience is teaching. So you've got to validate your results, you've got to validate your findings. So this is where we write um, essentially reports we, uh, and we publish them. So this is the writing papers part. And to do that, we have to uh, read a lot of other papers, read a lot of other colleagues' papers, um, uh, reports, I guess, and incorporating it into ours and making a valid report um, for publication. Again, teaching. So um, an average day won't have all of these in the one day. Um, you could do a whole day of experiments, you can do a whole day of analysis, or you could do one day, or you can do three things in the one day. But generally, these are the things that entail an average day in neuroscience. All right, so in summary, it's a very rewarding area of science. Um, you get to discover the unknown, you get to develop an insight into the brain, and you get to have your name next to that discovery in print for the rest of life. And you contribute to helping of others. Science is a lot about helping others, helping others in an indirect way, because what you discover today isn't going to impact people um, today or tomorrow. It's a very, uh, very much a long journey before you help people, but nevertheless, it's discovering the unknown to eventually help people. And international travel. In science, it's, it, as I said, it's an international community. So you don't just work with the people that are next to you and the people in the office next door. You work with people from different universities from all over the world. You have collaborations from America, from Brazil, from Germany, from Hong Kong. Um, and you get to travel to those areas to also present at conferences. So there, it, it's very much an international community. Okay, so career options. Look, I, not only I, I did uh, a doctorate in neuroscience, um, as my bio says, I'm also doing a, a doctorate in medicine. Um, and that's because I also like to help people directly. So I've spoken to you about the career in neuroscience. I've spoken to you essentially, you can take the lessons from neuroscience as quite the, the, the rule of thumb for all of research in science. Um, but if you want to help people directly, um, a bit more directly, I, I guess, um, there, there's medicine. And medicine, you can, you can study in four years as a postgraduate program where you can do a, a degree first in three years and then move into four-year program, um, which is what I'm doing at the moment. Or you can go straight from school, do it in five or six years. So if you don't want to get into, um, I guess, um, the, the science research or the science part of um, health and ha helping others, there's always the option of um, studying medicine. But what if you don't want to do medicine? What if you want to do um, other, uh, other ways, uh, sorry, other health um, careers to help others? Um, today, m medicine and I guess uh, the patient care is not just about the doctor at all. It's about collaborative care. It's about um, different professions coming together to provide the best service for the patient. So the other areas, in I guess the allied health areas um, that you can get into are things like physiotherapy. You can study physiotherapy in about four years straight from school, or you can do a, a doctor of um, physiotherapy in three years after you finish another degree. The great thing about physiotherapy is a very well-established profession. It's been around for quite a long time, and it's very, very good. What do they do in uh, physiotherapy? Well. They are the guys that do manual therapy to, uh, to, to, help, our, to help us, let's say, um, for example, recover our joints, recover, pardon me, recover uh, mobility in our, in our joints and strengthen um, stability. So the Australian Physiotherapy Association described, them, described physiotherapists are as experts in movement and function to overcome movement disorders. So for example, if you play football, um, or you, you're a swimmer and you get tackled or you, as you're swimming you dislocate your shoulder, a, a physio is a very good um, health professional that will help you regain mobility, uh, manage your pain and also um, you know, gain the stability in that joint. 
Um, physios see a broad spectrum of patients. They can see um, they can they can see patients with um, cerebral palsy, so someone that's born with a um, a, a disorder, or um, you know people like rolled ankles and dislocated joints in sports teams. So it's a very um, quite a broad. Uh, spectrum of, of patients, it's quite a rewarding career as well. Um, you can get into exercise physiology. Exercise physiology is four years to study. It's a new and growing field. Um, it's, um, they, they are, um, it's a, sorry, it's a new and growing field and um, they are exercise specialists that provide you with a, a regime of, uh, of exercise that will um, prevent injury or manage injury. So they they, um, they deliver the exercise um, for chronic diseases, for example, and injuries like cardiovascular diabetes, osteoporosis. Um, they help rehabilitate uh, patients with heart attacks, after heart attacks, and so on. Uh, the one thing is don't mistake them for personal trainers. These guys go to university for four years before they can write these exercise plans, um, whereas personal training is a six-week course. So... Um, um, exercise physiology, you can keep that in mind. It's a very good and growing um, field as well. Okay, so there's occupational therapy. I, I found this uh, picture that summarises it really well. So you, you, you have a, um, an area of allied health that tailors a therapy to aid in daily living after injury. So, for example, um, to stay at home, an elderly person that no longer can walk up and down the stairs, an occupational therapist would do an assessment on the home and would make living around the house a lot easier. Um, another good one I thought, this young guy, let's say for example, he's had a, um, he's had a car accident, he's now, a, he's now bound to a wheelchair, um, so an occupational therapist would help them overcome. A lot of the, um, they're trained to help um, patients with wheelchairs to overcome a lot of the challenges and help them, um, I guess, uh, regain um, some, some of the activities that um, all of us do, is, such as earning a living, so get a job. Okay. Um, nursing, that's, the, that's another area of um, health that you can go into. I like to think of nurses as heroes of the hospital, because they are. They're absolutely, you know, they're the heart of the place. Um, they educate everyone, they support everyone, and they give care for everyone. Um, they listen to the patients, they investigate the patient's problem, and they, and they do it with empathy and compassion. I found this picture on the internet and I thought, wow, it actually really describes what the nurses do. Um, and they're very much about patient care. So nursing only takes three years, and it's a great rewarding career. Um, podiatry, so the medicine of the foot um, and ankle. So, you know, you're treating a lot of um, patients with uh, skin problems in their foot or foot injury or infections. Uh, the, the most widely used of um, podiatry at the moment is, uh, is growing use, sorry, of um, podiatry is diabetes, which is essentially the most serious. It really gives um, patients with uh, diabetes a lot of problems, sorry, diabetes gives patients um, a lot of problems with their foot, which podiatrists can um, well manage. Paramedicine or the ambulance uh, takes three years and they're essentially the field emergency rescuers. So they're the first person on the scene, they're the first person to stabilise the patient before they can bring him to the hospital, and that's three years. At the end, it doesn't matter what it is that you do, there's one thing that um, you have to keep in mind. It doesn't matter what you do, it's gotta be, it's, it's gotta be from the heart. It's gotta be something that that's, sits here well, and you do it f with passion, and you learn it with passion. Um, how do you get to uni, how do you get to those degrees? All roads lead to Rome. You always remember that. It doesn't matter where you are, all roads lead to Rome. And you, you just need to choose which road is the best one for you at the time. So if you think you're in year 12 now and you can't get into the course you want to, well, there's alternative pathways. So you can, you, if you can get into direct to, to science or um, to medicine or, or whatever area that you want to do, um, you can get into directly to it, that's very good. If you can't, well, that's still very good because you can still get into it eventually. Um, you just need to do a bridging course or you need to do a year of something else at uni, college or TAFE, um, or, um, you know, and then transfer or finish a degree and then do it later. Remember I said about the postgraduate courses? So they're very good. So uh, just because you can't get into it now, um, just remember there's alternative pathways and remember the stairs. Um, your goals up here, how you get up to the top, 
how quickly you get up to the top is entirely up to you. But if you can't run up to the top, walking is just fine because you're still going to make it to the top eventually. So keep that in mind. All right, so this is it. Um, these are the pictures that I've taken from my iPhone as well, from all over, um, I guess, the places that I've traveled to around the world. Um, any questions? It depends which university, but I, um, I believe it varies from um, mid-70s all the way to mid-90s. But if you don't get into um, medical science, there are other degrees that you can start with first with a lower ATAR that you can, trans that you can then transfer into um, a medical science. The one thing that I actually would like to say is all of the courses that I mentioned to you, um, all, of the, all of the courses that I mentioned to you are... Um, available at the conglomerate of the universities that are providing this um, talk today. So Macquarie, University of Western Sydney, um, and Sydney University, Australian Catholic University, and UTS. So if, you know, some of the courses are found at all five, and some of the courses are found only at one. Uh, but nevertheless, all of the courses are available um, for you to, um, I guess, come to uni and study. <laughs> Uh, physiotherapy is very high. It's, uh, it's a, I think I believe it's about 98 um, uh, or 99 or you know it's it's quite up there. Um, but again, if you don't get into physiotherapy because you didn't get the 98 or the 99, you can do a, a year of another degree, you get very high scores in that degree, and use the scores of the degree to transfer to physiotherapy. Or very much you can do the postgraduate route where you study another degree and then um, do a, a doctorate in physiotherapy here at Macquarie for three, in three years. Maybe a, some universities can do a science and economics or a science and something else. Um, I'm, not too, I'm not too sure what the other double degree, what the second degree you'd want it to be. Um, but I know that um, now the universities have an advanced medical science program where you do a research um, component embedded on top of the medical science program. Um, so that's called the advanced medical science and you get to do research projects um, on top of the science which, and, and the research will be in different areas of um, science. So you get to um, not only study the different areas of science, but experience the research with world experts in different areas of um, science. <music> neuroscience is a branch, but also neuroscience is a degree. So um, I, I believe Sydney University offers a Bachelor of Neuroscience, um, but Western Sydney and Macquarie don't. Um, you can then transfer into neuroscience in the research, and then um, that's how you take up neuroscience. Um, but then, so I guess the answer is yes, it's an actual degree, but also yes, it's a branch uh, from something else. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure, but the UAC website would have the most up-to-date um, ATAR for it this year. <clears throat> the other thing as well for, the, um, for our um, schools from the um, rural um, uh, areas, um, it's, it's a look out for the extra, uh, the extra points that you would get for being a rural student. And more importantly, um, the scholarships available for rural students to come to Sydney um, and go to the different universities available for you. Um, you get lots of scholarships for, um, for housing or for education scholarships. And the one thing actually I, I would like to mention, if you're interested in neuroscience, um, and, if you're, and if you're the teacher at the school, I'm not sure if it's late for this year, but there is a competition that we run. So the, the, the professor that I showed you, Professor Maysfield, that um, developed the MRI and the micronography technique, um, 
he runs a uh, something called the Brain Bee Challenge. If your school doesn't have the Brain Bee Challenge, it's a neuroscience competition. It's really f a good fun. You get a book that you have to study and answer some questions online, and then if you make it into the top, uh, I think 115, you then get um, you come to um, our University of Western Sydney and compete in the state championships and then the nationals and then the internationals, and all of the travels um, are paid for on the national international um, competitions. It's good fun. Thank you all for um, listening. I hope I did not bore you and I gave you a good sound understanding of um, what it's like being in neuroscience. And um, if you don't like neuroscience, hopefully you'll make your way into medicine, physiotherapy or any other uh, of the degrees that I mentioned. So good luck and um, thank you very much.